chapter 34, something terrible happens. Now, when you read these passages, you need to remember that the writer is compressing events which happen over a number of years. It's not like Jacob arrived in, in Shechem, in this place in Canaan, and the next day his daughter was raped. That's not what it means. They had lived there for some years, for some time. There are many, many years which are compressed into a few chapters in, in the Scripture. They had made a home for themselves in the neighborhood. And it says in Genesis 34, uh, 1, that Dinah, the only daughter, went to visit the young girls her age who lived in the area. That's a very natural thing to do. But something happened which left her unchaperoned. Something happened which left her alone with, with a young man. And um, at a minimum, it was a seduction. In other words, at a minimum, he was the aggressor. And she resisted because um, it, it's, it says in the text that he took her by force. It says that in verse 2. So at a maximum, it was a rape. We don't know how violent the rape was. We don't know if she screamed and, and resisted the whole time. But he did want to marry her. He did have, he did have a goal which excused him a little bit in terms of what his ultimate motives were, but a rape is still a rape. I mean, he took, it, he took her by force. He committed a crime. He committed a crime that according to the law that would be written down by Moses later would have brought the death penalty upon him. And, um, but you have to understand that these are a foreign people, a Canaanite people, a pagan people. They have different rules, different expectations, different laws. And he was very confident that his father, who was the ruler of the area, could make it okay. This is a problem that we have with the sons of royals. They think that the law does not apply to them. They don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to keep laws. Because their father is the king, they can do anything they want. And evidently, he thought he could do anything he wanted. So after the young girl was forced, a negotiation takes place between the two fathers. And the proposal of the young man's father, Hamor, was that this is a good occasion to get the two families together. We're not going to be two families anymore. We're going to be one family. And our peoples are going to be one. Let's make this happen. Let's have a big wedding, and we're going to have the same family, and we're not going to regard ourselves as two different groups anymore. We're going to be one group. Politically, it sounded wonderful. It also sounded like a great way to cover up the fact that a girl had been raped, which is a terrible thing. Well, the sons of Jacob, um, they had other ideas. We go back to Genesis 17. There was actually a sign on this family, this chosen people, this family of Abraham, which would become Israel. And in Genesis 17, this sign is given to Abraham, and it's the sign of circumcision. Now, it's a little bit hard to talk about circumcision. It's, a, it's an embarrassing subject. It seems like a very unusual way that God chose to distinguish His people. Um, candidly, we associate uh, that part of man with two things. One is pleasure and the other is survival. Is there going to be pleasure in our lives? And is there going to be a new generation? Is the human race going to survive? Well, in that part of the body, God put a mark, and He put the mark there through pain. Again, um, a reminder of our dependence upon God and the fact that we look to God for everything in life. We look to God for pleasure. We look to God for survival. I don't really know all the reasons why God chose that way to mark His people, but He did. And so the sons of Jacob come to this other family who live in the land and say, if we're going to be one people, you have to take this mark too. Now, when we think about it, 
That seems like an amazing and a bizarre thing. It, it seems like it's amazing that that group of people would say, sure, okay. I mean, I would think they would say, are you kidding? You must be crazy. We're not going to do that. But it may be that they realized how serious the rape was. It may be that they realized that, well, unless we do what they want, they really have a right to kill our prince, to kill this young man who raped their daughter. So we're going to go out of our way. We're going to go to this great and embarrassing and painful and bizarre extreme to sort of submit to a strange ritual in their religion. If that's what's necessary to cover up this rape, if that's what's necessary to give our prince the girl that he really loves, if that's what's necessary to live in peace with these people in our land, then that's what we'll do. Well, you know the story. Now, I, I keep coming back to this. When we see these terrible things that God's people do, and when we see it reported in the Bible, we know that the Bible is true. The Bible does not cover up the wickedness of its major heroes. These are the founders of the Israelite nation. These are the patriarchs. These are the, the young men who would become the heads of the tribes. Simeon and Levi, the second born and the third born of Leah, the full brothers of Dinah. Levi became the head of the priests. Now, if you go to a secular university, we've talked about this before, we talked about it when we talked about the bad things that Abraham did. But if you go to a secular university, if you take a course, say you take a course in comparative religion, they're going to tell you that these stories in the Old Testament are not true. They're made up. They're fables. They are, this is what we said when we talked about Abraham, they are nation-building sagas. The priests made these stories up to make everybody patriotic and to make everybody proud of their nation. Well, is that really true? Is there really evidence for that? So the priests are going to say about the head of their tribe, Levi, that he involved himself in a, in a treacherous and murderous slaughter of an unsuspecting people who were trying to get along with him and who were trying to even submit to his own religious ritual. But that's what they did. Now, when we, we talk about these nations, this nation head by, headed by uh, Hamor, it's not like a big nation. I mean, it's really not much more than a village. And evidently, on, on the day when there would have been the most pain and the most necessity just to rest from, uh, for recovery from circumcision, uh, Levi and Simeon went from tent to tent while these people were recovering. I guess under the guise of just checking on them to see if they're okay. And when they went to, from tent to tent, they killed them. They murdered them. I believe that probably Levi and Simeon were just the leaders, that they took servants with them and that they had help. I don't know how many people they killed, but they killed a lot of people. And there was a great slaughter. I, I, I'm sure it took all night. But it's an amazing thing which they did. It's, ama it's an amazing thing for the Bible to report. It's amazing to think that that the head of your nation, who was who were supposed to be in covenant with God, could do such a thing as to commit murder. Now, obviously, when um, obviously when the uh, when the father of the sons hears this, obviously when when uh, when Jacob uh, hears what's going on, he. He says, how are we even going to live here? How are we going to survive? When these other Canaanites find out how you've treated the Shechemites, they're going to come and kill us. You've, you've made it impossible for us to live uh, in the land. Their defense, which is the last verse in chapter 34, is were we supposed to let him treat our sister like a prostitute? He's going to 
treat our sister like a prostitute and we're supposed to do nothing? Is that what you're telling us? And this is very male. This is male reasoning. It's very carnal. This is the way a man thinks without law. This is the way a man thinks without God. We have to have revenge, 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 revenge. The world today is full of honor killings, even mostly among the Muslims, uh, and mostly with young girls who embarrass the family. It goes on everywhere. It goes on in Britain. It goes on in the United States, in these communities. This is what men are like when they don't know the one true God. And even though formally Levi and Simeon are in a believing family, personally and in reality, they don't know God. They don't know who God is yet, or they wouldn't be deceivers and killers like they were. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Well, it's very important to, to notice the last verse of chapter 34 because it's going to become very, very important in chapter 38 when we're going to see something similar. Um, their defense is, he was treating our sister like a harlot. He was treating our sister like a prostitute. So we killed him. Well, they didn't just kill him. They killed his father, and they killed his brothers, and they killed every man in the village. Amazing. The Bible reports the wonderful things, the wonderful encounter with God in chapter 32. The wonderful reconciliation between Jacob and Esau in chapter 33. The Bible reports the terrible things, the horrible things, the slaughter of the Shechemites, the slaughter of Hamor and uh, his son um, and his father in, the, uh, in chapter 34. Terrible, terrible things.